Hello and welcome to the web series, Zero PM Pieces. In the Zero PM Pieces, the researchers in the project will tell you about one piece of the Zero PM puzzle that they're working on. So without further ado, here comes a Zero PM piece. Hello everybody and thank you for joining. Welcome to my today's presentation, Approaches to Measure PFAS Total, Mind the Gaps. The question is, why do we wish to measure something like uh, PFAS total? We want to have an analytical instrument for PFAS total, and the driver clearly is the sheer number of exi existing PFAS. There are about 5,000 CAS registry numbers in the OECD list, and of these 5,000, only about less than 3% th uh, are measurable by quantitative target analysis. So the wish to measure PFAS total lastly is born out of a, a frustration of the analytical chemist. The question is further, where to measure PFAS total? Where is it most important? On the, in the source or more in the sink? I would say it's important in both um, compartments because in the source, usually there are lots of precursors for example, um, fluorosurfactants from AFFFs, from firefighting foams, or other chemicals on soils, which can degrade and be transported in form of their degradation products and end up in a sink. In the source, it's interesting to know if we have overlooked precursors we do not know and which we cannot analyze by target analysis. In the sink, it's very important to exclude the presence of precursors. And that's the reason for uh, measuring PFAS total also in the sink. And interestingly, the first um, regulation for PFAS is given for a sink. That means for drinking water in the um, new EU drinking water directive. There is one parameter defined, so-called PFAS total, with a parametric value of 0.5 microgram per liter. This parameter is not further specified by a, um, by a certain uh, method or a certain protocol, but limit of quantification is still given uh, less than 30% of the parametric value and also an uncertainty of measurement of uh, less than 50% is also given. But still, there's no, no standard method or something else which could, could serve to uh, control this these parametric value. That means, more or less, this idea of a PFAS total parameter is still a dream. Today, I want to show you some approaches which might serve as a proxy to fulfill the, the request of uh, measuring PFAS total. And there are methods based on fluorine specific methods like the adsorbable organically bound fluorine or the extractable organically, organically bound fluorine, the EOF. And there are secondly, the perfluoroalkyl group specific um, parameters like the total oxidizable, oxidizable precursor assay, so-called top assay, which is another um, point in my presentation today. The second most promising technique to me is the EOF. And the first most promising um, parameter based on selectivity and sensitivity, I think, is the total oxidizable precursor. These sum parameters can be um, visualized as follows. The AOF, EOF, and the top assay that are um, destructive methods. In AOF and EOF methods, the chemicals which are isolated from a sample are incinerated, are combusted in an oven to give finally fluoride, uh, which is detected. On the other hand, the top assay is a partial oxidative digestion, which produces from perfluoroalkyl compounds such perfluoroalkyl acids, carbonic acids. The other two techniques today I don't want to talk about because they are either too insensitive like the 19F NMR or the instruments for pitchy are not um, available in most of the environmental labs. 
when we want to have a parameter like a PFAS total fluorine, then we have to first check what types of fluorine are included in a typical environmental samples, sample. First of all, most of the fluorine in a sample is inorganic fluorine, for example, in a, in a water sample or in a soil sample. This is the orange part here of these circles. Um, then is the second part. This is the red part here, the red and the green part together. This is the organic fluorine, and this divides up into an extractable part or adsorbable part. That's the green ones, and a part which cannot be extracted or adsorbed from a sample, and that's the red one. That means the red, the red fluoride or the red, red fluorine is a part which cannot be accessed by this by some of these methods. And the role of the PFAS total fluorine is a part of everything. That means it's a part of the extractable fluorine, the green part here, and a part of the non-extractable one. But also there are other organofluorine compounds like for example fluorinated um, pharmaceuticals or fluorinated pesticides. They are left and right of PFAS and they are not interesting to us, but we measure them when measuring EOF or AOF. The selectivity of these fluorine specific methods is determined by the number of steps and the nature of sample preparation steps. For example, the AOF, which is designed for water samples, only consists of adsorption step and a cleanup step for the removal of inorganic fluoride. And uh, finally, the, the loaded activated carbon with the fluorine compounds on it are, com is combusted in a combustion ion chromatography system. The EOF has one step more, has three steps, adsorption, cleanup and elution. And that means a larger discrimination of chemicals. And finally, the EOF for soil has an additional extraction step for soil, which often consists of ultrasonic extraction with methanol or alkaline methanol or something else. That means these are four steps in total, the extraction, adsorption, cleanup and elution. And that means the AOF is the most uh, non-selective parameter. The EOF from soil is the most selective of these, but excludes most compounds which are not extracted, which are not adsorbed here in the cleanup step, or which are eluted, uh, which are not eluted because they are adsorbed too strongly here. So all these uh, methods are defined by operation and none of them can serve as a real total PFAS method. The combustion ion chromatography in the end is as follows. We have the activated carbon, the loaded activated carbon or the methanolic extract from a soil sample, for example. We combust it here in the oven, absorb the the combustion gases in an absorption solution and analyze the fluoride by ion chromatography. The detection limits, the limit of quantification for AOF is in the range of one to microgram per liter. And it's the first of these methods which was standardized, standardized um, quite recently in October last year. But it's not sensitive enough for drinking water because one or two microgram per liter is too high to compare with the parametric value of the EU drinking water um, directive of 0.5 microgram per liters. However, EUF methods have a better um, sensitivity. Here we can use larger water volumes to be extracted. And here we can reach um, LOQs in the range below 0.1 microgram per liter. So these are a possible um, kind of method which could serve perhaps as a proxy for PFAS total. Just to give you one example for AOF application, this is AOF measured in groundwater samples from an airport where AFFF surfactants um, have been spilled. And you see the total bar here is the organic fluorine measured as 
AOF and the black um, part of the bars represent uh, known organofluoric and from fluorine and from this um, picture you can see clearly that we can identify about 50% of um, unknown precursors in in all these uh, measured groundwater samples. The EOF could be serve or could serve as a potential proxy for PFAS total. This complicated slide in principle says nothing else than that PFAS total is below 0.5 if EOF is below 0.25. Or in other words, if there's no EOF, there's also no PFAS in a sample. The value of 0.25 calculates as follows. Uh, there's the assumption that in, in many PFAS, there is a fluorine content of 15 to 70 percent. And that means if we assume a minimum um, fluorine content of 50 percent, that's a factor of 0.5 which then serves to the threshold value of 0.25 um, for EOF. And if the value is below, we know that the parametric value would not be exceeded. But on the other hand, if it's above 0.25, we don't know if it's PFAS or if it's other organofluorine chemicals. This concept will have to be verified, especially by screening of drinking water samples for EOF with a low detection limit to see if there are enough um, samples which fulfill this criteria of being below 0.25, because otherwise the method would be too inselective and we would um, see mostly other compounds than PFAS in this, uh, in this check. EOF for soil, we applied in the recent years in different projects. Uh, on soil, on agricultural soils, which were contaminated by paper fiber biosolids. And uh, these soils are contaminated by chemicals for crease proofing of food contact materials, like the PUPs or the DSUM PUPs, which are shown here on the right side. And what we can find here also is that we, if you measure the EOF, that's the large gray bars, and if you measure target analytes and sum up all the organofluorine from the targets, we end up with a, a gap. This is a gray part exceeding here the stack of the, of the colored bars. That means in all these samples or in most of these samples, we have uh, a gap of um, unknown precursors in these um, soil samples. So finally, let's come to my favorite. That's the total oxidizable precursor assay. And this is based on OH radical mediated oxidative digestion of water. Um, also soil, biota and AFFF samples have been measured in the past. And the principle is that we have an oxidizing agent and that's OH radicals, which are formed from peroxidisulfate in aqueous solution by thermolysis of this peroxosulfate and, um, and further reaction uh, of the sulfate radicals with hydroxyl ions. The method was originally published in 2012 by Houts and Sedlec and was originally designed for weakly contaminated water samples. In the meantime, there are numerous existing in-house protocols because other people measure also um, let's say more heavily contaminated um, matrices like soil or biota and so on. And there you need more oxidant in the oxidation batch, batch than using the, the protocol of uh, Houts and Sedlec. Basically, the PFAS precursors are transformed all to carboxylic acids, either to from sulfonamides to um, carboxylic acids with the same chain length or from fluorotelomere based precursors to give a, a, a suite of, of different carbon chain length, uh, which um, are formed by, by oxidation. Also some fluoroalkyl ether based uh, precursors have been oxidized 
and shown to give um, an oxidation product, an ether carbonic acid, carboxylic acid, which normally is not under the detected endpoints of target analysis. That means we can detect these carbonic acids as a placeholder for the, the precursors, which we often cannot measure. The range of the detected endpoints usually is, is C4 to C14 PFCAs, and seldom, very seldom, we have also included C2 and C3 PFCAs, that means trifluoracetic acid and the C3 acid. What can we do with this uh, top assay? We can, for example, check all these precursors given here on the x-axis, check how they transform during this uh, oxidation reaction. And we find then these are all telom telomeric compounds that we get several oxidation products um, in a certain range of concentration. And what we can do then with this knowledge is we can take this transformation or conversation factors and calculate from the precursors we have measured in the original sample, how much PFCAs have to be produced during the top assay. And that's the last term in this equation. And we can also measure the total um, increase of PFCA during oxidation. And from the difference of both, we can calculate how much PFCAs are formed from unknown precursors. That means we can calculate or estimate the amount of unknown precursors by this mass balance. You see a sec second thing from this picture. You see that in the case of short chain precursors, like on the left of this um, figure, the mass balance has a large gap here. And this gap stems from the fact that C2 and C3 are not measured in all investigations. That means a lot of trifluoracetic acid and a lot of C3 acid are missing here in these mass balances. And you can also see that volatile um, precursors are not recovered with 100% recovery, so, but often less, about 15% or, or so. And um, for example, 6,2 fluorocalomer iodide is not detected at all. So what can we do else? We checked here, for example, the factor of increase of PFCA during oxidation, first of all, in methanolic soil extracts, and second, in aqueous leachates from soils. And what we can clearly see is that the increase of PFCA concentrations in the aqueous leachates is very small. That means about 20% with a with a small distribution, which indicates that there are not much precursors in the aqueous leachate. In contrast, there are lots of um, oxidizable precursors in the methanolic soil extract, which is shown on the left here, and the factors can go up to uh, more than 20 or even uh, 30, post-top to um, pre-top. The same picture can be seen from the homologue distribution of the PFCA. This is a picture which is given for the soil leachates, and you see the pattern between pre top assay and post top assay is more or less the same. Except for the two long chain um, chemicals here, they adsorb to the reaction vessel to some extent, and that's because their concentrations are lower in the post-top um, figure here. That means the remaining um, pattern here also shows that there is not much precursors who could change this pattern during oxidation. Total different, totally different picture is given for the methanolic soil extracts. Here we have quite large differences in the PFCA concentrations with dominating concentrations of the even numbered chain lengths C8, C10, and C12, which indicates telomere chemicals as important precursors. 
But after oxidation, we have totally different pattern. That means the concentrations uh, are leveled to some extent. And please notice this is a logarithmic scale. That means there's a dramatic increase, especially of the low and medium chain PFCAs. But oxidation is not the full true, truth um, regarding top assay because of stronger oxidation conditions in, in recent publications, all, sometimes also um, hydrolysis um, occurs. That means we have um, sodium hydroxide in the solutions with long reaction times and high concentrations of oxidation reaction solution. We have also the possibility not only to oxidize in the top assay, the precursors, to the carbonic acids, but also from these sulfonamide precursors, we can hydrolyze them to give PFOS as hydrolysis product. And this can be seen in the last slide here. This is the results from an interlaboratory trial, um, top assay in a soil sample, and labs two to labs three, they measure more or less with similar conditions. And lab one has a totally different um, measurement protoc protocol. Labs two to five, they first extract the sample and then oxidize the methanolic extract. And we, if you have a look at the PFOS bar, this is a blue bar here. The PFOS bar before oxidation is very similar in all four labs. And after oxidation, it's nearly the same with some um, additional PFOS in these two labs. But when we go to the lab number one, we have after oxidation reaction, lots of produced PFOS here, which is not consistent with the results of the other labs. And the reason is that the protocol here is not an extraction followed by oxidation, but here is a very small um, sample would was oxidized with very high content and high volume of reaction of, of solution. And this has the effect that the pH, the starting pH of the reaction is about 14, where in the other labs is about 13. And then that means is much more alkaline here in this lab and produces hydrolysis products uh, in addition. And this might be also the case for the higher um, PFCA production of the other chain lengths. So this shows that is a promising parameter, the top assay, both for drinking water, but also for such heavily contaminated um, soil samples. But what we need is urgently a standardization. And with this last slide, I thank you for your attention and I'm open for the questions. Thank you. Zero PM, zero pollution of persistent and mobile substances. This project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme under grant agreement number 101036756.